could you have voted for him, Roseanne? He talked about jobs, Jackie. He said he'd shake things up. I mean, this might come as a complete shock to you, but we almost lost our house the way things are going. Have you looked at the news? Because now things are worse. Not on the real news. Oh, police! That was earlier this week. You pro maybe you watched it. You probably heard a lot about it. A lot of people watched it. How many over 20 million Roseanne the revival 20 years after the first time around they brought it back a network television sitcom with an audience of over 20 million people. That is an astounding number. Network television doesn't get numbers like that anymore and it caused quite a bit of stir in politics because as you just saw there the show was very political and the audience appeal this is the interesting part. The audience appeal for this, it was Trump's America. The top markets, this got a lot of attention this week for this show. The top markets, look at this, Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh area, you know, that was the heart of Trump country in Pennsylvania, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Kansas City, Detroit, Chicago, Cincinnati, Dayton, St. Louis, Oklahoma City, Buffalo. These are the top markets where the rating was the highest. Look at this, you know, Philadelphia was number 12, New York all the way down at 31, LA at 38. This was not a show in the major coastal population centers that popped that much in the ratings, but boy, in these other places it did. The interesting thing here is too, if you look back to when Roseanne first came on the air 30 years ago. We dug this up. It was the same story really back then. Tulsa was the top market for Roseanne when it came on the air 30 years ago. It was number two this time around. Houston was up there. Here's an interesting one. Seattle and Tacoma. That area has changed demographically in the last 30 years. It was up there in 88. It's nowhere to be seen now, but Buffalo, Scranton, Knoxville, Detroit, Cleveland, Albuquerque. These are the kinds of markets it scored in 30 years later. So Roseanne has always had that sort of, if you want to call it, middle American appeal. Uh, what you would now call red state appeal. But the difference is, of course, 30 years later, Donald Trump is president in this show, at least in that first go around, seem to connect with those folks with a main character who supports Trump with an actress who publicly supports Trump. Interesting questions here going forward. Who's going to keep watching? Is it going to grow in these areas? Is it going to shrink in other areas? Roseanne, if you needed any more proof how political it got, well, the president himself, he was talking about it this week. Even look at Roseanne. I called her yesterday. Look at her ratings. Look at her ratings. They were unbelievable. Over 18 million people. And it was about us. They haven't figured it out. The fake news hasn't quite figured it out yet. And joining us on the set now, New York Times reporter Trip Gabriel. Matt Welch is back with us. Uh, Trip, I'll start with you. Um, there's a big debate there about what these ratings mean. I mean, look, the simplest answer is I think it was a lot of people would agree. It was a funny show. It was funny the last time around. It was funny this time around. But it did connect with the part of the country that normally these sort of hit television shows don't connect with. And it connected with messages, at least from the Roseanne character about Trump, that you're not hearing in a lot of other places. No, I think that's absolutely right, Steve. And, you know, one of the interesting things is a lot of uh, network television lately has, the last few years, has been about um, uh, diversity and underrepresented uh, populations. And I think a lot of people responded to this show in the markets that you just highlighted because it was about representation. They were seeing a shabby couch. They were seeing, you know, working class people who are, you know, uh, splitting the pills that they get. They can't afford their pills. Their, uh, you know, work and employment are big issues. So I think just seeing oneself on camera, you know, drives a lot of that ratings. But what do you make of it, uh, Philip? So uh, two things, and, the, and we've had, we had this conversation earlier this week, but I, I think that a lot of this is also driven by the fact that one of the things that Donald Trump seized upon in the 2016 campaign was a very particular sense of nostalgia. And I think that that same nostalgia plays in two ways with, with the Roseanne re, uh, revival. First is that simply it's a revival. It's a very popular show back when it first debuted, back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and, and so it's not surprising that people would feel nostalgic for it as they do with other TV shows. But secondarily, it was also very nostalgic for the same sorts of things that Trump was was expressing nostalgia for that same sort of sense of an America that has passed. After we had a conversation earlier this week, I went back and looked at the numbers, actually, in terms of what had changed. It's, it's, it's theoretically set on the town of Elgin, Illinois. And one of the things that's fascinating is that the first episode was very political and showed a lot of tension that I don't recall from the earlier show. But one of the things that happened in Elgin, it's in two counties, Cook and Kane, both of those became extremely democratic. They became much more democratic counties between 88 and 2016, while the counties that surrounded became slightly more Republican, even 
more Republican, but not to the same extent. And I think that that divide that we see just in those two counties where Elgin is, is reflected in the difference that we see in Roseanne as well. And the, to connect this to, to politics, to the world of Roseanne, you're saying Elgin, Illinois, I know that was, it, it, this, we could get into a really right. weedsy thing about where in Illinois this right. town is supposed to be, because they gave some clues that also placed it elsewhere. But where it is it nationally, and when we're talking about politics, is it is in the heart of that sort of, <clears throat> we talked all the time about non-college whites, whites right. without college degrees, blue collar whites who turned out and voted for Trump at the margin was 40 points in the exit poll. Very interesting thing that came out this week. There's been some uh, some study done post-election about what we saw in the exit polls and, and what was actually the reality on election day. And here's the thing. Look at this. The, the data you see on the right, there's some reason to think this might be a little more reliable than what we got in the exit polls. This is the share of the electorate that is non-college white, working class white. And look at that. The study that's been done now since the election shows it was probably a lot higher, significantly higher than we thought it was on election day. And so you play that out. Look, we already thought non-college white, there was this surge. Folks, a lot of them had traditionally voted Democratic, hadn't voted before. There was something about Trump. Maybe there was something about Hillary Clinton uh, that didn't sit well with them and got them to turn out. And there may be more of them. It's, That's the upshot. And it's also, let's, a lot of things have changed since then, but so has media, right? A Politico did a really great story one year ago, Jack Schaefer. They, they measured all of the reporters in the country, and they found something really startling. Between 2008 and 2016, the, the percentage of working reporters who lived in places that Hillary Clinton won by, or the Democrat won uh, by 30 percentage points or more, was like 32%. Eight years, six years, eight years later, it's 51 percent. Reporters, as they have, they've been losing reporters in newsrooms, covering state houses, local reporting is shrinking. Everyone's moving to New York, right? My neighborhood voted 92 percent for Hillary Clinton. I might think that I live outside of the bubble, but I live right inside of the bubble, right? Just like the Saturday Night Live skit. So as we have, as our culture is being created by people who live in massive bubbles, anything that's from outside of that has a pretty good betting chance to take advantage of a market inefficiency, as we say in baseball and other things, right? So if you are actually representing a part of the country that is ignored or sneered at, you got a puncher's chance. I, and Tripp, you spent some time in uh, in Pennsylvania, and we all know Pennsylvania and its significance in, in 2016, and obviously its significance going forward. I'm interested, though, in what Matt was just talking about there, because I think the, the culture, the media, whatever you want to call it, that folks absorb around the country is very different now than it was a generation or two ago because of exactly what he's describing, which is more and more media is centered in these major coastal areas, and the local newspaper is going out of business. The local newspaper is 12 pages now. The local newspapers filled with wire copy and and that's about it and it used to be this this much more sort of vibrant center almost of civic activity when you're on the ground out there in Pennsylvania what does that feel like well, it's very true, and, and the way it, you know, it, it's its saddest loss is for coverage of Harrisburg, you know, state state capitals, uh, Richmond, Virginia, which is, has a pretty good press corps, actually, but a lot of the state capitals are undercovered. But in, in terms of the national um, uh, campaigns and what we're going to see in the midterms, uh, these races uh, willy-nilly are, are nationalized. So um, I was in the 18th District in Pennsylvania, which recently had the special election, and the, the media coverage is... Uh, Basically, it's paid advertising. It's a barrage of advertising from a lot of outside groups, and we're going to obviously see a ton of that in the midterm elections. And that's, um, you know, that's the framework that uh, voters are, 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 are hearing, and they actually rejected that framework in southwest Pennsylvania in this most recent special election. Um, the, uh, the Democratic outside groups were, you know, played it pretty cool. They did not... Uh, Put a lot of money into advertising in that in that election, and so Connor Lamb, the Democrat who won, you know, in, in a very unlikely district, uh, was able to define himself without the uh, the you know the the, um, the spin and the and the framing of the uh, the, the national groups. So. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more of that, too. And that's, Alexi, that's an interesting point, too, because there's been this, this debate uh, I, I've been watching and, and seeing within the Democratic Party about uh, two questions. One, whether to do some sort of major outreach to these sort of non-college white, working class white voters we're talking about. And then if, if you're going to do that, how should you go about that? And, and some folks I, I hear say, hey, this is just a lost cause for Democrats. Others say, hey, look, just four years before Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama did well enough with the uh, blue collar whites to win Pennsylvania, to win Michigan, to win Wisconsin, not even close really in, in, in those states. So what do you sense within the Democratic Party uh, about that challenge? Is that something that, uh, that just pick a new nominee in 2020 and the problem can take care of itself? 
So I've actually reported um, a lot on this recently, trying to figure out what Democratic candidates are being advised to do in 2018. And the DCCC, the DNC, these different campaign arms, even progressive groups like Priorities USA are encouraging Democrats to sort of show a willingness to work with Trump, to appeal to more moderate voters. They're encouraging them to talk about how the economy is improving, but not necessarily give Trump or Republicans too much credit for that. They're encouraging them to talk about economic issues and health care, which I reported on today for Axios. So there's certainly thinking about these things moving forward. And I think we can continue to see them prioritizing publicly when campaigning working class voters issues. But I think one thing that Democrats and Republicans both need to think about is that when we talk about the American working class, we're usually only talking about white people. And the American working class looks like me, right? It looks like my dad. It looks like people from all different backgrounds and races and ethnicities. And when I talk to Democratic aides on the Hill, they privately complain to me about how they think the Democratic Party's largest problem is the the fact that they're ignoring minority voters. And so I think while they need to certainly prioritize issues that matter to working class members, they need to think about how that encompasses all people, not just white working class voters. Yeah, that is exactly the uh, the, the debate and the discussion I've been hearing uh, uh, within the Democratic Party, and, and it's a fascinating one. Do you, do, you, uh, uh, do you double down sort of on a strategy of trying to win back non-college whites, or do you say, you know what, we can expand the tent in different ways, and, and can you do both? Or is it a choice between one or the other, seeing a lot of different opinions? on that. It's a discussion. Obviously, it's going to keep going for a while. But Matt Welch, thank you for stopping by being a part of this tonight. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.